I remember it was a very small picture the size of a postage stamp. And it fascinated me. It drew me in. You know, I wanted to get closer and closer and closer to it, like underwear catalogs when I was a child, you know. All the photographs of himself were shot by him. You know, he was the model, he was the photographer. But again, they're mesmerizing. You can get lost in them. And I'm not a groupie. There was something about him that delivered, came through uh, on screen. The Prince Valiant haircut, the bandana around the neck. There were films, there were unabashedly, openly gay porno films that he was the star in, and you hadn't seen stuff like this before. Two that I'm aware of, Knights in Black Leather and That Boy. Always skin-tight pants, and they weren't jeans or anything. They were like this, like a cotton that left absolutely nothing to the imagination. He really was not afraid to let his sexuality shine through. And that was huge for me, to, to see that someone could be comfortable with their sexuality. You wanted to be with him. You wanted to be touched by him. You wanted to have an experience with him. He rarely appears. It takes now this decision-making when I decide it's time again to get into that character, to play my part because mostly I am not Peter Berlin, but I am Armin, Baron Armin Hagen von Heuningen Hühne. What a beautiful name, just hinting that I'm not coming out of the, out of the gutter. I like to be in the gutter by choice. And there are a lot of people I met in the gutter, famous, famous people all in the gutter. Peter Berlin was a, an iconic gay sex figure of the 1970s, a guy who created a sort of image that he lived, as near as I can tell, 24 hours a day uh, for the enjoyment of the rest of us. Peter Berlin was a great porn star, but even porn star, I think he was a great exhibitionist, basically, that wore a signature haircut that looked like the Dutch boy on the paint can and leather outfits and a crotch that when, the, when you first saw you thought it was like a joke. It looked like that he had stuffed 50 rags in there. He didn't seem to have a lot of irony about it. That was kind of the amazing thing. He wasn't campy. I didn't see him at art events. I didn't see him at like the Cockettes or, or any of the hip bars or anything. I saw him always in a sexual setting of some way, even if it was in the middle of the day downtown walking around on Market Street or getting on a bus or something, you know. And he always was dressed as this, with this dick, with this incredible crotch that was like, how you think of like Jane Mansfield walking down the street and the girl can't help it when the ice man looks up and all the ice melts on the truck and she's holding two milk bottles. It was similar to that. He took an erotic fantasy and stylized it, uh, almost as a choreographer would with a ballet dancer. For example, if I, if I played a Western character in a film, I, I put on the cowboy hat and the uh, jeans and the chaps and the stuff. He played a Western character. It would be a half a vest with his, uh, with his chest exposed with a stylized a leather kind of a chap. It was always one step further so that you weren't supposed to accept this guy as somebody that was home on the range. It was a guy that was an extreme fantasy that you might find in a surrealistic dream or in sometimes a nightmare. He, you know, really stood out because his attire was very different than the typical clone look of the time. Sort of a plaid shirt, denim pants, tight pants look. 
Peter's clothing was very theatrical by comparison. How can I talk about Peter? I never said a word to him. I fucked with him, but I never even spoke to him. I can tell you how good the sex was. <laughs> There's no one like him. There's never been anyone like him. He's as strange as Garbo. And uh, in many ways, to many people, as interesting as Garbo. Without having been on the world stage in the same way, he still has enormous fame. And uh, luster. Just very lustrous. I just never was politically correct. I said, I go all the way. I include the cock into the picture. But then you become a pornographer and you are put on the lowest level of that what society has provided for you to be, you know? Oh, the first time I saw Peter was the first time I was arriving in San Francisco. But unfortunately, I was with my parents. We were arriving in town for my brother's wedding, and for some reason, we were driving up Third Street. We probably drove right past the toolbox, uh, the very famous leather bar, which is probably where Peter was strolling from. He was coming up Third towards Market, and we passed him, and all heads swiveled to look out the window, and my mother absolutely gasped utter shock and said and she said what's he selling and I just popped out of my mouth himself um, I saw Peter as a shining example of self-creation and self-identity and all the potential that a gay person could be and I was also totally unaware of hustlers at the time which is probably what my mother saw so when she said what's he selling she saw a monetary event occurring, whereas I saw the selling of identity. When people tell me and they said, oh, Peter, you are so great, you look so good. I say, yeah, I know. Tell me something what I don't know. What? How can you say about yourself that you are good looking? I say, yeah, I look at it and say, I like it, okay. Big deal, it's obvious. Don't give me the obvious. Excite me amuse me, do something, but please don't bore me. I saw images of Peter Berlin in After Dark magazine, and they were the most arresting gay male images that I had ever seen. And Peter Berlin is what I expected uh, gay males to be like, what I expected once I went into this community that I would find all this room full of men looking like Peter Berlin. And uh, boy, was I surprised. <laughs> In a sense, Peter Berlin's photographs are more like paintings than they are photographs because the character is so embellished. You, you can't really, at least I can't, approach it as typical pornography at all. I think he's an especially fine photographer. For one thing, his subject matter is rare. There are, there certainly are photographers who fetishize the male image, none of them are fetishizing their own image. So there's a double whammy in that. But in creating the set and the look, in sewing the clothes he's wearing, and in staging the photo, it's a real one-man show that's rather impressive. I was a product of my time, and, uh, and he was an extension of the time. He was not, I reflected, I think, a great deal of what was going on at that time. Uh, he was pushed, he pushed the envelope, and it made me then wonder what brought him to that. He invented this persona. My question that I don't know is how he made peace with that persona, and if he ever did. I don't know if he was a, an escort or that, but I would imagine he was not ever, he never had ads where he could come take his picture. I bet you could take his picture. Not even, not, you couldn't even take his picture. He had no money he made from that. Where was there drugish? I mean, did he have a downfall? Did he have a bad life? I don't know. Did he have a regular job ever? I mean, did he go in, is, was he like Clark Kent? He would like, you know, put on that outfit and then go by day, be a bank clerk, and then be Peter Berlin by night? I still can walk and talk, and even people recognize me still as Peter Berlin, what is sort of nice because 
If you can, as a 60-year-old man, get a compliment from a stranger like en passant on the street calling you, you look cute. I never will forget that. Now, who in the hell with 60 years old can look cute? I said, my God, Peter, you are really good in sort of making people not see a 60-year-old man because actually I feel like 90. And there's nothing good about old. Old is old. Nothing? No. I first saw Peter, I was in a bar in Berlin on the Kudan, and the bar was called the Cat Sea, and this Dutch boy walked in. Anyway, that's what I used to call him, a Dutch boy, because he looked like a Dutch boy. He looked like a little painter, you know. And he had all this equipment with him. <laughs> the face, the body, the tools, the jewels. And I didn't know who Peter Berlin was at the time, you know. I just thought, he's somebody, you know. He's like one of a kind. I remember uh, I moved to San Francisco in 1986. One day I was in a cafe or something and all of a sudden Peter Berlin walked by. My eyes bug bugged out of my head because here was like a, a basically a cartoon character um, walking in front of you, you know. And I just remember, you know, I don't even think I paid the check. I just ran out of the cafe and just, you know, stared at him and looked at him and, and I remember you know, the first time, especially, I remember calling up someone and said, oh my God, I just saw Peter Berlin. Uh, the people I worked for bought the, the building I live in and uh, uh, moved in. And all of a sudden, one day in the stairs, there he was. I mean, it was Peter Berlin because he still looks like Peter Berlin. I mean, the same hair and the same pants <laughs> nearly. And uh, so I started talking to him. I had to, uh, being the manager of the building. And it turned out he lived right below me. I mean, the apartment right below me. And I talked to him and not even mentioning that I knew who he was. And I don't, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about that the other day. When exactly did I tell him I know who you are? And it must have been the day that he said, well, let's have coffee. And, and I went over to his place. And of course, you can't. Uh, not know who he is when you walk in into his, his apartment. For one thing, it, it was like for me going back to the 70s and the 80s because the whole place looks very much like back in the hippie days with lots and lots of stuff all over the place and uh, all of his pictures everywhere. So I, I acknowledged that I knew who he was. And I guess the more I got to talk to him, the more he started telling me. And the more I realized that he really wanted to tell his story. Whatever happened to him? He is still not out there. Anyway, so, so we take this. No, 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 no. This is very valuable. Am I still? How? No. Let the world decide. Should he have a lifting or shouldn't he? Now, look the difference. You know, it's just very little. This has to go. That is an Italian magazine, I guess, who had... Because, you see, I was this internationally famous person, you know. It's if true. one thinks about it, it's true. And I am the first one who was amazed how, again, how little one has to do in order to be picked up by the press or so, because, I mean, basically, the world is sort of quite boring, so that little off the edges and, of course, what people want to uh, hear about and, and read about. Let's see if I find something I can... That picture here, I know, my friend James carried in his wallet. You know, that sort of a self-portrait, what I... Like, everything is a self-portrait, but that was, you know, when I was just young or younger, but I was at least 32. Looks younger, no? I always looked younger than I am. So he carried that, now I carried it. And here I found, you know, that's James loves Peter. You know, that little note I found. So I kept all those little mementos, you know. 
that is a Merry Christmas um, uh, card what Tom of Finland sent to me. I remember I approached Tom of Finland a long time ago. Uh, I commissioned five drawings from my photographs and I remember I paid $300 each. It was a lot of money for me, but that was his rate. So he worked on them and sent them to me at some point. Such a nice man. Once when I talked to him again, I told him that it would be really interesting to film him while he was drawing. And he said, no, no, no. When I draw, I'm all by myself. And I knew what he meant. If somebody would have liked to film me while I was taking my photographs, I would have declined too, because it's such a private matter. I needed for that work complete silence, complete uh, 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 intimacy. So then I did this whole series of double exposures when I exposed the negative twice. I put marks on the floor and on the wall, and sometimes you can see it in the picture, so I would know where to stand. I did quite a good job because people would ask me if I had a twin brother, and I always thought, my God, it would be interesting to have had a twin brother, but I just didn't have one. Sometimes I would underexpose a whole roll of film so I got very inferior prints and in order not to throw them away, I used oil color or pencils to make them look good. And I did a good job. I think they look sort of romantic and of course erotic. You asked me yeah. and I told you that I wanted to do my own documentary because I see myself as a filmmaker in some capacity, because I made two of them, I said, okay, but am I a filmmaker? I'm like, oh God, in, in, in 40 years, I made two films. More of my time, I watch television, so I'm more a television watcher than filmmaker, right? So since I didn't do anything for 30 years, you come along and you thought, oh, Peter, it would be maybe a good idea because you're so interesting, you know, and people want to know about it. So I said, okay, do it because I have proven to myself that I haven't done it. I did an interview with him and later I did a, a rather monumental size drawing of him, uh, which is in three parts, it's a triptych. We did an interview with, on a Sunday afternoon in Soho. At that time, Soho was just a mass of warehouses. There was nothing commercial here at all. And uh, it was in a vast loft, sparsely furnished loft. I had never seen a space like it so raw and big. And by the time we started talking, I knew that one word or two words from me were all that was necessary. I didn't have to have questions. I just had to have a good sense of where he wanted to go and to just give him that energy. Of all the interviews that I've done, and I've done dozens and dozens of interviews with porn stars, it's still my favorite because it's the most individual and it's the craziest and I'm using crazy in every sense of that word. You know, it's just plain crazy, or it's wonderfully crazy, whatever, crazy. And I, you know, there was just one philosophical idea after another in it, all very vain, but at the same time, very human in its vanity, because he was also presenting ideas like young, beautiful men shouldn't go to war, only men over 40 should go to war, because after all, they're finished anyway. People think you have to deal with punishment, deal with weapons, dealing with pushing and shoving, forcing, and that's where this idiot male comes in. He goes to war and kills, and why? I don't feel I owe anyone 
to say I'm living now in freedom because somebody died? What bullshit. What an insult. What an insult to humanity. I wish they would all refuse to go to war. I certainly never would do it. They would have to kill me before I kill someone. Did you, did you set out to be famous at the beginning? No, no, you don't set out to be famous. You are setting out to be loved and wanted. That's what we all want. That's what is calling looking for love. I want to be loved. And I achieved it by just making the best of me, using whatever I had, and sure enough, it worked quite well. Well, I think the, what makes it unique is its sexuality, the upfrontness of it. I mean, the thrusting basket, the bare chest, the silky hair. The Peter Berlin type to me is very comfortable with their sexuality, extremely sensual, somewhat androgynous, but more on the masculine side. The hairdo and stuff, he wasn't, he didn't try to be like, that macho, or it was confusing. You didn't know what it was going to be. It was like Dinah Shore with a heart on, with that hair. You know, I mean, it was. You didn't quite know what it was, but he did look good in a way. He did look great in a way. I mean, I get that he was a turn on to people. I don't know if he was a turn on to me or not. I, but I couldn't stop looking. I liked seeing him, and I marveled at this, especially just when I would be getting off a bus and would see him walk by and think, Jesus, you know, he goes out like that every day. I, I give him great respect for, for being that, living that extreme a lifestyle. And in San Francisco, it is possible to live like that. And it wasn't an image you forgot very quickly because it was so specific and almost cartoon-like. Peter had a, a, a European image, I would say a kind of uh, mix of a French sailor and a German rent boy and a little bit of everything thrown in. He would head out into the streets in one of his incredible get-ups. I mean, they're beyond fashion. And I also think in many ways they've been an influence on fashion, you know, the, this kind of bold display which we now see. I think that he's got a hand in it in the same way that Tom of Finland is almost as influential as Chanel, you know, because Tom of Finland taught gay men how they wanted to look. They had no idea they were wearing little suits and holding a martini, you know. Peter Berlin was expressionistic at the time. What he was doing was an art form. He was being defined as a, as a sculpture, whereas that wasn't true with me at all. I was hired to be the guy that, uh, that you knew, the guy that uh, lived around the corner with somebody's... Uh, big brother or you saw in school or something. I, I would have a hard time in all my images to find the one. And sometimes I fantasize about, you now what would be the image look like, what I would think would express that, what I want to see in a man. I disappointed a lot of people who, who saw me as a caricature, what I created, you know? Marilyn Monroe was one thing, but Norma Jean was a whole other story. Being born into a blue blood family with my grandmother's side of philosophers and attaches, and then my other side of artists and photographers, you know, there's one very famous, George. Uh, von Heuningen Hühne, who was a photographer of Hollywood. And so there's where my roots are coming from. I was born, uh, you know, with the pigs and the horses and with land. But my father was killed in the war, just at the end of the war. So I never got to know him. But he was beautiful and sensitive. I have nice letters, what he wrote to my mother. These boys, like my father, didn't have the slightest idea what Hitler was doing, you know. But then he was killed by trying to get a comrade out of the minefield. So he was dead. And my, my mother then, with three children, young children, were fleeing. 
from the Baltics down to Berlin, where my grandfather and grandmother was living. So we lost everything. I grew up very poor, and I'm so thankful for it because everything else was gravy. And I'm even amazed how well I did because my life was always outside the norm. It was never like anyone else's. As long as the gay issue is sort of somewhere else, then pe people either reject it or don't mind. But if it hits home, then I can see my mother still crying and crying. And in my heart, I, I knew that, that not only don't I do anything what I couldn't live with, but that there is no way that anybody could talk me out of it. The result of that um, situation was that I basically had to leave. And so I lived for the first time by myself and loved it from day one to be completely free, like not having to tell anybody where you go tonight and when do you come home. I think I was about uh, 18 maybe. So I learned very quickly that there was a lot of action out in the streets, in the parks, train stations, and all those, those, those underground places and had the greatest time with everybody else who was there. But it was sort of a thing what people didn't talk about. It was just not what was accepted in the gay community. They all had those double standards, you know, one hand, you know, being prissy and dressing up, on the other hand, sucking dick in, uh, on a tree in a park, right? So these nights, these warm summer nights, and there were the, what is it, the, the, it's, it's called the, the Lindenbaum. It's one of those big trees who bloom in, in, in the spring or somewhere, and they are so heavily perfumed that you had that, that beautiful um, fragrance in the air, the moonshine and the people. I mean, it was magical. The first sexual feelings I had with another man that was uh, uh, what I, I think mentioned uh, uh, the 13th of August 1961. I remember the date because of that very historical happening of the uh, b building of the Berlin Wall. And one of those East German boys picked me up, took me over to the East, I spent the night. Uh, it was sort of good, but I remember it, it. I, in my mind, I already, I was looking for something specific. And my obsession till today, I never have met anyone who, who shared my obsession from his doings. The obsession would be if someone does something on his own to get me going. Now, usually, because of my attire, for my uh, sort of uh, way of dressing and way of behaving, I did that to people in person and on picture. So my obsession would be to have a person approach me looking like me and forget the face. It could be black or blue or white, could be any given attractive man. So it's not that I'm looking for myself, but someone like me. That would be heaven for me. It never, never, never happened. I always had to do the work because whenever people wanted to take me on their hand, going where they wanted to go, and I tell you where most people want to go, three things. They want to get fucked. The second thing is get fucked. The third thing, get fucked. And then the fourth thing is sucking cock, right? 
that is in itself nothing wrong with it, you know, but that's not my obsession. I can go without fucking, without sucking, without kissing, and I wish I would <laughs> just want to kiss you and I would feel all that what people seem to feel when I see a kiss on screen. It's like looking at a nice pork chop in a butcher's uh, display. It just doesn't get me, right? And yet in your films, it's a lie. I don't know exactly on what alley or what park I met Salminio. I only remember that I liked his looks. He was beautiful. I met him and I went to his hotel and I think it was in Paris and I mean we had a good time and what he immediately let me know is you know that he just loved, loved white jockey shorts. You know, and I like the idea. I mean, I have my own fetish and uh, white underwear sort of fits uh, very much into it. I love to, to just take the naked body and with all our uh, refinement, very late in my life, I, I did my, my job by using what they then invented, the pantyhose where you not only cover your body, but your ass and your crotch. His thing was he wanted people to want to have sex with him. Whether he ever did or not, is, it didn't seem to be part of the equation of his success. During the interview, he told me, he described to me a typical night of Peter Berlin cruising, getting himself done and hitting the street and sort of choosing someone and luring that person deeper and deeper and deeper into his world of standing in doorways just long enough to make the person feel he could approach him and then skittering away and going to another doorway and knowing the person would follow him. And this could go on for hours, um, kind of luring and frustrating this person at the same time. And then just suddenly it was over. You know, there was no human contact beyond the visual. And uh, I suppose that he could probably be defined as being a great visual artist because of his look and the fact that he had boiled sex down to a visual trip. You know, that he turned people he came into contact with into voyeurs when all they were looking for was a little sex, you know, a little hands-on stuff. I don't think they ever got that. Foreplay starts the second you lay eyes on someone. And of course, out of experience, I realize the longer you draw out the time of talking, that's where you are better off shutting your mouth and you just observe from a distance. If you get close, and if one talks, everything can be destroyed. So rare, you know, that it will enhance. My experience is that silence is very exciting. Drugs became very much a part of my sex game when I came to America, that the first night in New York, I was introduced to drugs and I stayed with them. And I wish people would realize that uh, that is much healthier than, for instance, drinking and smoking. Of course, if you go off the wagon with heroin and shooting up, you know, then uh, you are as badly uh, in a position like a drunk who just can't stop you know, with some nice glasses of wine or a good cocktail. Jochen Labriola, who, who lived in Wiesbaden at the time where I was working as a manager of a movie theater. And while I was putting these posters for the, for the coming attractions in my theater, 
he said, oh, you know, um, I see you sometimes with the camera, you know, I have a camera, I have a Hasselblad, and I don't know, can you maybe explain certain things about the camera to me? I said, of course, yes. So I went up to his room there, where he had a room in that hotel, and I explained the Hasselblad to him, and then I realized he was not interested in the, <laughs> in the Hasselblad explanation, but in in me. And at that time, I was about twenty something. I was always uh, in need, like I think everyone in that age, of of admiration and and uh, you know uh, um, attention. So he wanted one thing, you know, like all men want one thing, you know. And I gave it to him, and we became good friends. And then, then offered me to 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 go with me to live in Rome. And I said, I I don't have any money. Oh, money is no object, you know. And you know, just come with me. So we lived in Rome for about over a year. And he became my best friend for the rest of his life and uh, for my life till he died in 1988. And he got me out of that German uh, Kleinkarriere, you say in German, like small checkered view, you know, with a small German horizon. He became a painter after he, after we broke up, successful painter because he had something what I never had, a good sense of selling yourself. There was such a good time in Europe at that time in the 1960s. Paris was so exciting. So I lived there for a while with my friend Jochen. And I remember the whole program of the day was to go to have a coffee in the coffee floor. And if you didn't find a place there, you went to the De Magot. And then there was that kiosk where you had newspapers, so everybody pretended to read while sitting there with their coffee. And people were just cruising, seeing and being seen. That was the only thing what people were doing. I always lived so very well, if I uh, think back at that time, like a millionaire, not having a penny in my pocket, but because of the friends I had, especially Jochen, it opened up a beautiful world of great horizons. Oh yeah, then we went to Acapulco one day, and I made a stop in New York, and I liked New York, and I stayed in New York. That's how I, that's how I came to America, just loving it, you know? From New York then, after a couple of years I stayed there, I sort of got to California, to San Francisco. Now in San Francisco then, I started then to become Peter Berlin. No, I saw him around first and then I heard about Knights in Black Leather. That boy, I, I don't remember, um, uh, I don't recollect seeing the theater. Of course, you know, that was the 70s, and the 70s <laughs> is like a big fog. <laughs> San Francisco in the 70s was an incredibly uh, exhilarating epicenter of social, 
political, economic, artistic um, whirlwind. You could walk from, you know, O'Farrell to Jackson and there would be guys in every doorway of every storefront either giving it away or selling it and it was truly like something out of Janae. The first evening I decided to have a look at the nightlife of San Francisco's Broadway. It was a thrill to watch all different kinds of people, prostitutes, hustlers, drunks and dope dealers all made up the picture of a Barbary coast that can have little faded from its days of past glory. Peter Berlin was really just uh, one in a long line of uh, interesting um, street personas that have been invented here in San Francisco ever since the early days when when the Emperor Norton was walking around with his little dog and his full regalia on or earlier in the 70s there was a guy named Jesus Christ Satan he knew that he'd he'd invented a personality that was rather compelling and uh, and he was very much a part of the landscape it's always happened here really I don't know that it was a special thing uh, you know that it was exclusive to the 70s although certainly the air of freedom made it easier for him to do what he did. I started my film in 72, and that was exactly when I was 30 years old. So I started my career even that people would say, my God, the career's already over. Uh, Peter Berlin was never young. Yes, I think, mean, you know, he, he never was, but that image, thank God it's there and I can die now and it's there, you know. It will be hovering in the annals of gay pornography, it will be there forever and I can sort of gracefully get old. I met a friend like in 1970 when I came to America who happened to go to the Art Institute here and uh, was making his master's in filmmaking. He showed me his piece for the judges, I guess, whatever they have to submit to get their degree. I told him, uh, you can show that to some friends and your mother and they all will like it, but it's a bore. So why don't we make a porno film? I always uh, felt like I wanted to present myself in that fashion. There was always sort of a thrill of that exhibition uh, element. So we uh, started to uh, shoot when, they, when the sun was shining. There was never a script and never a big idea. He edited the film. He was doing the sound and uh, uh, I had nothing to do with the with the making of the film i just was in front of it and telling him what to do so i sort of gave him the idea to the shot here or make it all and he went to los angeles to show oh, to the shit. distributor they liked it what was very good to hear because i thought you know it was not a great piece of art there all i need to do is line the grass just ignore the people Last week I met quite a few, and you know how it goes. Conversation. Hello, what's your name? Peter? You have a nice accent. Where do you come from? Germany. Oh, how long you have been here? You like it? And after I go through this 20 times, even the faces look all the same. I naturally get tired of it, because I know exactly what they really are interested in. And it all happened in San Francisco. The porn of the time was almost cinema verite in the way it depicted gay men's lives and the explosion of our sexual culture. And Peter's movie is right in line with that sort of filmmaking. It does depict the lives of gay men and certainly the locations and the look with, with great truthfulness. You like the frame? Huh? Yeah, it's very really neat. I would in town, you know. I think it's very nice, these things here. It looks good on you. Why don't you have one, huh? I don't know, i never seen one before. You must take it off from your boots, you know. Or you must buy some, you know. They're nice. 
You like leather? Sure, what do you think? Well, I don't know, I was just asking. I have a leather jacket. Is that all I you mean, can? I have... No, I have some very nice leather jeans. You really should see them. You know, this kind with, with, with a punch in front, you know? With a punch? Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, how do you call it? You know, my English is not so good. A pouch? Oh, a pouch. Oh, a pouch. <laughs> Yes, no, you know, I mean, really, it's... <laughs> Why are you laughing? You know, I, th I think my, my English is pretty good. You know, the dates for Warhol's movies are uh, definitely 60s late and later 60s. The Warhol anti-narrative movies, someone once called it. So that sort of filmmaking was definitely in the air when Peter's first movie came along. But in its casual approach to narrative, in its almost refusal of having narrative, while it documents a long cruise, or, or the boring party, or just the elements of street life that focused Peter's seemingly aimless existence, his drift through society, there's many elements of the Warhol non-event, of the documentary feeling. At one point, this really got to me, they go to a party, and unlike any other porn movie where they try to have a good time at a party and give the drag queen a couple of witty lines, Peter announces as the scene starts like this was an exercise in Brecht. Most of them turn out to be so boring. And this one was no exception. He tells you before you even arrive that it's going to be a boring event. And in truth, it is. It's very Warhol. They sit on a sofa. They've obviously, they pass a joint. You see too many beer cans in front of them. Nobody's saying anything witty. The drag queen tries to have badinage with one of the cuter fellows, and it's really tedious. And you're kind of glad when after only seven minutes that seem like much longer, Peter leaves. Although it really disrupts the sex, I really liked it because it's as truthful as the rest of the movie is. If Peter is setting up a fictional character, they've really very cleverly shored it up. They don't take you to a fictional party, they take you to a real party. They're very literary, his movies. Um, that's where they're different from mine. I had no sound in mine, I only had music. Peter has a lot of talking in his movies. It's usually he's writing a letter, and so it's a voiceover, or he's telling a story to somebody. I just met a young boy, as I was wearing my leather outfit, who took me to his place, dressed himself up all in leather, put on a swastika armband and an iron cross, having me stand in the corner of his room, which he had hung with floor-to-ceiling mirrors, and told me, we are both strong, we are equals, the world will bow before us. I did not dare to tell him that I voted for the socialist in the last German elections. Peter's character, just walking through these scenes like, oh, this is what happens every day in San Francisco, if you happen to be standing around as a sexual icon. His whole body is a sexual thing. He's a full-body genital, is what he is. And then there's Peter on the, on the narrating the soundtrack. And what does he say? That was a pleasant diversion for a restless night. Uh, actually, the, 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 the main thing what really put me on the map was the advertise and the advocate. Full page for weeks and weeks and weeks. And that sort of, that poster, what I designed, uh, created a buzz, and then uh, the film came out, and the film did very good business. It uh, got my name known. I already started to call myself Peter when I was asked many times, what's your name? I said, Armin. What? I said, Armin. And I got sick and tired of it, and one day somebody said, what's your name? I said, Peter. Oh, Peter, I said, yeah. When I made the ad, I f first called myself Burian, and then I got a big uh, letter from a lawyer accusing me of stealing someone's name. I said, I don't need that name, and I changed it to Peter Berlin. I. Uh, Realized then when the film made a lot of money that, of course, the people who were supposed to give it to us 
put it in their pocket. I always, all my life, I worked without lawyers and I never cared for money too much. But if you don't care for money too much, then you don't get it. So, but I didn't mind, I had a good time. And my friend was very disappointed with the, with the financial uh, outcome. So he was not interested in making another film. So the second film I made, I did all on my own. I edited it and I was shooting it and I was um, uh, um, putting it together with the sound and I never did anything. I just sort of picked it up and by looking at it and it's not a big secret how to put something together. As a filmmaker, I would say um, that Peter probably is closer to my style of making films than anyone else that made films in my period. And uh, that's why I liked his films, I guess, because they, they, they had some sense behind them. They had some sensitivity behind them. Um, of course, as I, again, the primary thing is the ego. I mean, it's a Peter Berlin film. It's, you, you saw a film to see Peter. You didn't see it to see him have sex with somebody else. It, that was like dessert. When he undoes his jeans and then he has on shorts and he undoes the shorts and he has on something else and then he undoes that and he has on something else and he gets down. I think he's got five layers. You see, it has a sense of humor there. It has a, a, a little levity in there to, to ease the, you know, the heaviness of the situation and also to make it more palatable. So I think, I think again, that's who he is. He's, he's someone who has that, um, uh, that lightness in him and all this darkness and all this ego and all this other stuff, there's still that little levity that's there. I was now knowing, okay, don't give it to some distributor. So I gave it to a friend of mine who happened to be a distributor in New York, and the same thing happened that friend or not friend, people just are not very, very good or very honest with money. And I became very, very famous. I was even surprised that uh, I got these fan mails suddenly, Peter Berlin, oh, everybody has, I mean, I was always part of the talk, oh. And I heard stories about me, lies, 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 because... Like what? What kind of lies? Now, people, first of all, that they, oh, yeah, I got fucked by Peter Berlin, I know. I mean, from, I already stopped fucking in the, what, in the 60s? I mean, when I came to New York, when I came to America, there's not one person in America who got fucked by Peter Berlin. Okay, now the stories were, oh yeah, I got fucked. And I, I listened to that story and I, it's sort of, I mean, I don't mind. I always was a very private person. That means people, even if they would have liked to get in contact with me, would have been very difficult. And somehow uh, uh, I got offers uh, uh, and I got uh, uh, inquiries. I never would have been able to do it with someone else. I think if, I don't know, Alfred Hitchcock would have come to me, I probably would have said, okay, maybe there's something. So I decided to not do any more. But I, don't, I didn't decide it immediately. I, I said, okay, maybe next year I make another one. And then I said, okay, next year. And the year passed and then another year. And so it went on and on and on. And then I just said to myself, okay, Peter, you just don't make another film anymore. But I started to sell my film in parts and mail order and I made some money with that. I got bored with the whole thing and then sort of I just stopped doing it. But I kept on photographing myself and then when the video came into fashion, I videotaped myself usually exclusively by myself because I am still a very shy person and I never could perform uh, like the porno stars do. He had the definite potential to be huge, you know, to be as big as a Calvin Klein ad or as big as a, um, I mean, he, he could be mainstream now.
He told me one day that uh, a spokesperson for Jean-Paul Gaultier called him and they said, we'd like for you to be the spokesmodel for our line uh, Jibo, which is, you know, the kind of moderate priced clothing. And Peter Berlin answered the phone and said, ah, uh, Peter is not here. I am the maid and he will be out of town for eight months. And that's what he used to do. And I looked at him and I said, why did you do that? I said, why would you not want to be in these ads for, for Jean-Paul Gaultier? He goes, oh, because then I have to call them back and they have to call me back and they have to come here and I have to do the photo shoot. And, and that's the way he lived his life. You know, he just could not be bothered. He's like the, the Greta Garbo of porn. Hey man, can't you do anything else with your cock and show it off? Oh, I can. So let's go fuck. I don't want to. What do you want? If you don't mind, man, I like being by myself. Uh, when I lived in New York with my friend Jochen, who had a big, beautiful loft there, and everything was provided for, so I didn't have to work. So I went to the 54, I went to uh, all the clubs, and sure enough, Andy Warhol was always there. And since he now knew me because I became known as Peter Berlin, he greeted me and I greeted him. One day, my friend Kors, who is a designer in New York, said had an invitation to one of his tea parties. So I walked in and then I heard him saying, oh, Peter, I like your pants. So I had these incredible, intricate things, you know, crotch and ass. And he asked me, polite as he is, oh, may I take a picture of your pants? And I said, yes. And, and the picture, I will never forget, I was sort of leaning against the table sticking out sort of my ass with the leather pants and Andy was this little, you know, Instamatic or whatever, you know, a completely little camera, snapped a picture, thank you, thank you. But Andy turned to me and said, Peter, I'm so glad that you come and I think what you're doing is really great. And you know, it sometimes makes a difference who gives you a compliment. He offered me to, to, uh, use his staff to use his uh, sort of studio. You know, he had the equipment in the Peter. I think it would be very interesting for people to see how you do it. So please, I offer you to, to, to use it and I will be helpful, you know, if you need me. And I said, oh, thank you very much. Now, do you think I picked up on that? Never. I spent a lot of time on Fire Island. Now, the reason I got to Fire Island in the first place because I met Robert Maplethorpe. Where did I meet him? I can't remember if that was sort of in a dungeon or somewhere because that was Maplethorpe's world. I mean, our world collided quite often. So he told me that they rented this house on Fire Island and if I have nothing to do and I never had really anything to do, I'm welcome to stay in that house. I got there for the weekend and the poor people like my friend Robert on Monday had to work. And I was sort of residing in that house by myself, you know, so I was on that bunk bed with a big window and you just could look out on the beach and you know people cruising and I mean fabulous fabulous and when at that time Robert was not the big Robert Maplethorpe he just was sort of starting to be recognized but Robert again was a very very uh, down-to-earth person and driven to have success and mingling, you know, in these business. It's not just 
the photo or the painting what you do is the people you hang out with. That means the people with the money going to the dinner parties. And then when they drag me to those dinner parties, you know, oh yeah, so I couldn't wait till it was over and then going, going in the underworld again. Like everybody else, I had seen uh, Peter on the street, so I was rather excited when I heard that he was going to be a guest at a party that was being thrown by a, a Pacific Heights hostess. Among the few other guests who were there were, were Peter Berlin and Robert Maplethorpe. And five or six of us had a, a lovely dinner table conversation, and I found him to be uh, an interesting man who had a lot of interest beyond uh, what I might have imagined. And uh, I liked him very much. Um, but three days later, I was out at Land's End, where, you know, the, the sort of uh, cruising meat market of the city, and there was Peter, sort of posed in the crook of a weathered tree, creating this sort of tableau, really. And without thinking, I just sort of walked up to him and said, Hi, Peter, it's Armistead. <laughs> and there was no response whatsoever. It was, it was a, I had committed the cardinal sin of breaking that wall. Uh, it was kind of like, uh, I don't know, you know, like walking up to uh, Minnie Mouse at Disneyland and saying, Hi, Suzanne, because you know the person inside the suit. I had, uh, I had broken the spell, so I walked away rather sheepishly and let him continue with the tableau. <laughs> Robert curated a show in New York where he asked me to be part of it. And there were five, six photographers. And then fo he photographed me, one of the very few people who I felt comfortable or actually obliged to say, okay, if you want to take a photo, take a photo. So he made a photo, several photos, one in Fire Island and one in his, uh, several in his studio. But I only can remember now that what is still hanging on my wall, what was done on the boardwalk somewhere in the island. And then there was another photo what he shot in, in his studio. And I remember when I lived in San Francisco then, it was hanging in the, in the, in the, in the hall somewhere. And my friend James, just had a fight, I think, with, with someone, and uh, everything was flying, including that uh, framed photo of Robert, you know. So I only have that one other photograph. What's still hanging on my wall? Because uh, no other fight erupted and it didn't end up on the floor, you know. That uh, was my friend Robert, and then, of course, um, he got sick after my friend Jochen got sick. All my friends got sick. They all acquired the virus. And I was one of those people who didn't acquire the virus. And I'm still negative. Yeah, so I, I just I, meant at the beginning when all your friends were dying, all, I mean, you must have felt, God, I'm not dying, I, you know, and they're all dying. Yeah, and I, I bet I, you a lot of people out there think or thought at one point, you know, he was a porn star in the 70s, I'm sure he's... Oh, yeah, no, that wouldn't have been a surprise uh, uh, to, to, to have heard that Peter Bullen had it. Of course, the way he lived and the way his conduct was, uh, people wouldn't be surprised. What they, of course, didn't know is that, that I, by, by the virtue of, uh, of conducting my sexual life basically as a safe sex proposition, so I was spared that and I can see it as being lucky. On the other hand, I have seen all my friends go away and I ask myself now, who in the hell is a lucky one? In 1976, I was going to a nightclub and Somebody came to me and asked me f to dance, and I never, I'm not a dancer. So I rebuffed him, and then I was outside sitting in the car. It was sort of already a little bit cool, and then that boy came, saw me in the car, and approached me again. And, you know, I uh, said, May I sit down in the car because it's so cold out there, you know? So we started talking, and I took him home, that was James, my friend James. He had a problem with his roommate, 
And then I said, Naja, then stay here with me. And I lived in a, in a studio apartment. And she never moved out. It sort of, it, it just, you know, she just stayed. And, and I had, we had one bed, and she slept in my bed. And um, at that time, I was then, you know, doing a lot of shooting myself, you know, with photos. So I said, oh, I want to take some pictures of you. And she said, sort of, she became a little strange. I said, what's wrong? And then he said, no, yeah, I don't know. But, you know, I have, I have, a, uh, I had polio as a child and I have a deformed leg. So we did pictures by just hiding that. And even the videos, what you see, you never know. When we went to the beach, he, he knew how to have a towel there and you know so he did a great job that most people didn't even know you know it was such a such a awful thing in his head he never got to accept it he always i remember even before he died he just looked at his leg i hate this leg i hate this leg and that was part of my way to trying, when he moved in, to, to give him a little support and, you know, to not, you know, because of that I wouldn't like him, you know, so those things don't bother me, so, yeah, I stayed with him till, yeah, about 20 years. We had our 20, what he said one day, oh, you know, what is today? I said, no, it's our 20 years anniversary. So then when he got sick, and um, battled along. He was sort of a person who loved living, and that's why I liked him. He had that spirit of exuberance and liked to buy stuff and give stuff. You know, at some point he got paralyzed, and I had to wheel him, you know, in the wheelchair. Had to go to the hospitals, and and but then he got these infections again and again. And one day he said, just. You know, uh, I will not take any, um, you know. I, I remember the day when we went to, to, to his doctor. She said, uh, okay, James, you know, then we just will snow you out. I don't know how long after that, maybe in that week, one morning, then he said, uh, can you, uh, you know, uh, Make me a pudding, and I knew what that mean, meant, you know, because he told me, he already said, you know, I will kill myself one day, and uh, I never believed it, because we all say, oh, I kill myself, but then, you know, but he made his decision, and he talked about already having saved, I think we had two bottles of uh, morphine. I was going in the kitchen and doing the cooking of the pudding, you know, because I never believed in the instant stuff, so I was cooking there, and I was so stunned, you know, he was in his little room waiting for me to bring him the pudding, and I made a vanilla pudding and a chocolate pudding, because he called it, oh, the swirly, like the mixed thing with chocolate and vanilla, and then brought him the... Uh, thing and he took that bottle boom 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 and I was sitting there and he was sitting up and started to eat it. I watched him, you know, and I already saw him sort of responding to that overdose. So I said, no, scoop down a little bit, you know, get comfortable. And his last words were you, you, you always have to tell me what to do. Scooped down and fell asleep and slept. And I called a friend of his, actually. I said, oh, come on, can you come over? So she came over and I was sitting in the living room and he was snoring, actually. He was sort of like his open mouth snoring and we heard him sleep and we talked and he slept and for hours and then slowly we could 
she is a snoring getting weaker and weaker till it was only breathing and at some point I uh, told her I I wouldn't even go in the room you know like some people say somebody died in my arms for me death is sort of already it has nothing to do with the person it's gone it's right so she went and then oh yeah he's already cold but uh, for 20 years i mean we 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 lived together we 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 had fights i know one day uh, he was sitting in the closet you know and crying because Unfortunately, he had a big drug problem. So I guess if he wouldn't have died of uh, that, he would have died of, of drugs, you know. And James, um, well, yeah, I mean, I know he, he, put, he, he got a dog. He wanted a little dog, a little Shih Tzu. And I always said, yeah, it's a living thing already planned. You know, you have to water, but you know, a dog, you have to go. And sure enough, when we had him, he got sick, and I had to take care of him, you know. And then he said, Naya, so you have something to love, you know, and he's gone. So I'm still poor and now old, so what's left for me? Do you think you were a fashion influence? No, no, no. Maybe one or two boys, they dared to imitate me. The main thing what I would like to have achieved is being in the class of a Calvin Klein or Armani and would have given that what in France that Gautier has done. Am I coming off as very bitter about that? What I see may be, and the inability of me to have made an input, to, to have given uh, some kind of a, uh, inspiration to a young, beautiful man to just say, okay, I have a dick and I have an ass. I don't think I should necessarily hide it. I don't mean that he should display it in a naked fashion. I think that's as boring as, as being dressed badly. But you know, there is a way of using fashion and using fabric to, to sort of enhance your personality. And if you look good, then you shouldn't hide it. I think it's even a crime. Oh, I remember porn stars before him, but there weren't that many that you knew their names. There weren't that many that had a persona, you know, that, that was so extreme and so really defined. That was the thing. You, you didn't ever hope he would do something else because you knew he would not. Was he the first porno star? I don't know. I think the first one that would come to mind for me would be Casey Donovan. He's a... They're equally memorable. I mean, porn stars now have, what, a 15-minute shelf life, or, or is it 14 minutes? And he has endured for all this time, as have a handful. I mean, there's Casey Donovan, Al Parker. These people made a place in, in gay men's hearts, you know, and they meant something. They were icons. And Peter Berlin, who made fewer films, than any of the aforementioned, is very powerful in that group. He is one of the enduring stars of this genre. And I think that's amazing because decades have passed and uh, he's still remembered. He was really thought of as, a, as, a, as an artist, as an artist. I was thought of as, a, as, a, as an actor and they weren't quite sure about that. Well, watching Knights in Black Leather gave me such a strong feeling for Peter that I strongly felt he should be a Grand Marshal. 
in the gay parade. So I, I think he's certainly worthy of honor. I don't think he'd enjoy that, would he? That would be the last thing what I would do. I don't know if he ever had more than one pair of, of those tight pants. Um, it's interesting. Um, and those should definitely go into a museum with, with Jackie's pink suit, believe me, because um, many, many people have fantasized about those pants. He should make a new movie for gerontophiliacs. I mean, however old he is, there are people, wrinkle queens, that like him older. If you would tell me I could redo my life, right? I would do it in a split second. Just a repeat. I would do the, the loop without any, because the pain, what I suffered, even the, the loss, you know, and uh, I mean, I wish only what I could redo in it is the happiness and the well-being of others in my life. I would like to have changed, but me?